you with the correct amount. T20 Radio, your gamers roll. Roll for initiative. Greetings, Gamer Nation. Welcome back to the Roll for Initiative podcast. This is issue number five. I am one of your hosts, DM Vincent, along with DM Jason. Jason, how are you this week? Issue number five. I like it. We're issues. We're we're, we're no longer episodes. I think we're going to move on to an issue because we're more of like, I like to compare us. Actually, you made this example a while ago and I wasn't sure about it, but I kind of like the idea. We're like a Dragon Magazine, an audio book. We'll try to be. We will, uh, yeah, yeah, because we have, we have some plans to bring uh, more and different things in uh, as time goes along. I know next week we have our first uh, of our, our new, let's call them columnists then, <laughs> or correspondents yeah. uh, that will be joining us, and hopefully that will continue on. So, yeah, yeah, I guess it's turning into a little bit of a magazine. And uh, we have quite a bit of uh, feedback, and uh, everybody, we appreciate everything you uh, wrote to us so far. We can't read everything because it's so long, and... Uh, you can go to the D20 Radio Network forums, d20radio.com, or the dragonsfoot.org forums, and you can go check out the information there. Check out um, the Order 66 podcast, the flagship show of D20 Radio Network, and uh, they have a couple other shows there, but we won't get into that now. We're going to focus more on our show, which is the most important thing, right, Jason? Uh, no, let's talk about Order 66 for the rest <laughs> of the show. <laughs> okay, um, well, that's a Star Wars podcast, and it's a D20... Star- no. No, I, I I have to say I hadn't <laughs> listened to it much before joining the network because I don't play that particular Star Wars game. Mm-hmm. But now that I have been, uh, it's similar to what I've heard some people say. I can understand how somebody would listen to our show without playing the game because their show is really entertaining even if you don't play it, which I don't, and I still enjoy it. So thanks, guys, at Order 66. It's a great show. Oh, definitely, and you can find them at d20radio.com. I still don't know what Order 66 stands for, although it's obviously <laughs> clear from listening to the show. I just don't know enough about Star Wars. Uh, Order 66 briefly was the order given in the uh, the third movie of the uh, Star Wars trilogy when the clone warriors had attacked all the Jedis and, and wiped them off the face of the Earth. The Emperor had given that order. So what was Order 65? Well, they never <laughs> clarified those orders. <laughs> uh, it was all maybe right, wash cool. your helmet cool. or something. I have no idea. Cool. Um, well, one piece of feedback that we got uh, this week was really good. We got it from in our forums at RFI Podcast. Well, not our forums, our comments. Mm. We don't have forums. Uh, from a reader or listener who goes by Biopunk, and he pointed out that the Dragonfire uh, Dungeon Master's assistant, the poster, the artist for that was Keith Parkinson. Oh, uh-huh. okay. And cool. so I actually did uh, get a hold of Eric... Brindleson, and I said, do you think that's right? And he said, yeah, that's the name. So thank you, listeners, for knowing things that even uh, the people who worked on the things didn't know. We have an awesome audience. Yeah, a lot of people pointing things out and helping us out along the way. As we help you, you help us. We, you know, hand in hand, back and forth. Uh, thank you to GM Chris of Order 66 for giving us some kind words and uh, listening to the show as well. Thank you, Chris. Feature 1. Okay, uh, I just want to move on to uh, Feature 1, which is going to be our artsy craftsy section this week. Uh, Jason, what do you think about that? Another arts and crafts project. Okay, sure. <laughs> I don't know if we have an arts and crafts section, but I like what you're talking about this week. So that's good. Yeah, th- um, this week I'll bring your own stuff. Yeah. yeah I, I scoured around. Uh, I, I was actually, this is from, I found this from my information because I was like, oh, I need a DM screen. I don't mm-hmm. feel like paying. The twenty something dollars for a screen that's falling apart that some guy had in his basement that was holding his mouse cage together or something. I don't know. 
mm-hmm. or that probably smells like a dog. I wanted my own custom screen. So what I did is I found this uh, blog. My screen sp- does not smell like a dog, by the way. Well, I'm, my screen is in very good shape. I've seen. Have you seen some of the screens out there? No, no, you're right. Okay. Now this is the old guys RPG uh, blog, uh, which we'll, we'll give you the link in the show notes, but. He goes uh, on and telling us how you can build your own custom screen that looks just like the screens you see out there. So what he did for his first step is he goes over and he has little pictures here, which we will show you. Um, He tells you to head to the store and get one of those science project displays that the kids use for school for dioramas and displaying little things uh, for their class projects. And he Mm -hmm. cut it in half vertically. So now he he can make actually two screens if he wanted to. And then you would fold it. And so it's like the try screen for a DM screen. Now what you can do is there's other various ways you can use clear tape. You can use um, those uh, paper protectors that you buy in the uh, the binders, the the whole papers, and you can tape it onto the back side, which is your side, the DM side, and you can put whatever sheet you want in there. So if you wanted to make a custom sheet, Jason, for your game, you can print out your own sheet and have it in your screen right there in front of you. And then if you yeah. want, and if you want yeah. flavor, you can print out your own artwork and put it on the other side. Yeah, and, and I see in the posting that he did, he gave downloads to the uh, screen charts for uh, Dark Ages and for the core Osric rules. And of course, Osric is the retro clone that is compatible with first edition AD and D. So that's a great way if you don't have any access at all to the DM screen to uh, to the original TSR DM screen to get that. And you know we should point out that you know just because TSR made a dungeon master screen doesn't mean that it was the only official DM no. screen that you could use. Even back then, you could buy ones from a lot of other companies. But um, yeah, you can buy definitely. But this also with this, you can also uh, use it for any game you want. It doesn't have yeah. to be for Osric or AD and D first edition. It could be for fourth edition. It could be for third edition. It could be for Marvel superheroes, for all that matters. Whatever you want to put in there is customizable to your game. Yeah, I actually tried, um, before you brought this up, I at one point had tried making my own screen because I couldn't find my old DM screen. And so I took these uh, folders that were just regular file folders, a little thicker than normal. I found them somewhere at work and tried using some duct tape and some scissors and things to make them. And, you know, you can pretty much do this with any good hard board that you have. Mm. So I think he has a really good example, though, using the Science Project ones, because they're actually even bigger than the original uh, DM screens were. And they're already, it's very easy to fold them to the way you want it to look and uh, cut them very easily. It's just because it's meant for kids to use at school, so... Yeah, and that's one of the other things is just making sure you have something that's going to stand up. I think you might want to look into with something like this, even having something, putting some plastic pockets on it, like some clear plastic pockets, so you could put different tables in. Right. You can slip one out, and depending on whatever game you're playing, and put another one in. Yeah, definitely. Even even with AD&D, because the thing about the the DM screen, about the original TSR DM screen, is that... Most people that I know that use them use them because they look cool and they're nostalgic and you just – well, especially if you've got the original, the golden one, not the, the second one that was made for first edition. And uh, the actual charts and where things are on them is not really – I don't think it's the best placement. So I would make my own DM screen just to have better tables in front of me. Well, yeah, that was my whole idea. I wanted my own custom tables on there as opposed to using the, the Star Wars screen that I had. <laughs> That's I, pretty cool, though. I like the Star Wars screen idea. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's something maybe we should, you know, go into in a, in a, in a future issue. Uh, but it, the idea of what kind of tables you have available for you and what you really have at hand, because when we talk about making things uh, for the game, I have a combat computer that I didn't make. I just took it out of Dragon Magazine, uh, in this case, by uh, making a color copy of it and then cutting it out and uh, oh. lamina- laminating it and everything. That's that giant wheel combat thing, right? Yeah, I'm sitting here playing with it right now as we talk, actually. So you can uh, turn to the uh, armor cra- armor class that you're going up against and you look at which uh, 
class is attacking, and you can just look on there quickly and see uh, what the to-hit rolls are that are needed, uh, what the adjustments are for different weapons, hmm. uh, non-proficiency penalties, all those kind of things. Wow. So, yeah, it could be pretty useful to do. It was kind of fun to make, and I leave it laying around on my desk at work sometimes, and people wonder what it is. But uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of cool things that you can make uh, for your game without having to necessarily go back to trying to buy some original things. And I'd actually be interested to hear what different people have made on their own as well. Yeah, definitely send us an email, rfistaff at gmail.com. Visit our website, rfipodcast.com. Leave us some feedback. Yeah, if anybody out there has made any homebrew dice, please let us know if you've made your own dice. Ooh, that that would be interesting to hear about that, definitely. <laughs> I don't think they made their own dice. Hey, why not? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe. Well, you know what, though? Actually... Okay, a little bit of a history thing because I'm having so much fun going back and reading old stuff. Apparently before Gary Gygax even discovered that there was such a thing as a 20-sided die, which he found by looking at a school supply uh, catalog, what they used to do because he was upset with the fact that dice didn't – if you rolled a bunch of dice, you wouldn't get a smooth uh, randomization curve, is he would put coins into a bag and pull out of the bag so that there would be uh, that would be his way of randomizing. So hmm. that's interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no. But anyway. Uh, yeah. Well, if you have any more tips or you want to uh, tell us how you put your coins in a bag, and and Jason would love to hear all about that. In RFI staff. Yeah. Tell me about your coin bag. At gmail dot <laughs> Suddenly, your torch goes out. You fumble around the darkness to relight your torch. When you do, you look up and see the creature feature theater. Well, folks, it's alive again. This is the Creature Feature Theater. And this week in the Creature Feature... No, I can't do the accent. Never mind. Uh, (laughs) I'm going to go with the gas spore. Yeah, this was a uh, listener suggestion. Mike sent this in. I believe he's Sieg on the uh, dragon's foot form. Am I pronouncing that right? Oh, okay, Sieg. All right, yeah. Great. Then, then uh, I, I know exactly who we're talking about, and yeah. I I like having that recommendation from him. Thanks, Mike. He he gives us a lot of feedback. Uh, I get an email from him at least after every episode, and he tells us some wonderful things about uh, the show that he's found in his perusing around the net, or he knows from his knowledge, uh, wealth of knowledge. And he also suggested that we, uh, uh, if he wants to do it himself, we'd appreciate it, but we can also do it too. Spells that didn't make the player's handbook, just to look at what didn't make it. So that'd be kind of a fun segment hmm. to look at, right? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd have to. Where do we get them? Uh, that's what I didn't get an answer from. So. Okay. Well, you know, I think that'd make a great segment. Definitely. So the gas. So the gas spore. Uh, so this is a monster manual um, creature. Uh, but it's one that your player. It's a uh, good one for your players if they. I um, haven't encountered this before, but they do know what a beholder is. Mm. You were talking last time about a trick that you pulled on your <laughs> players once. Oh, the tiny beholder, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, this would be another way to do it, is because the gas spore, when uh, you look at the picture in the monster manual, the first thing you think is that looks a lot like a beholder, and it says in the description that at any distance greater than 10 feet, it's going to look, it's 90%, sorry, not 10 feet, 10 um Oh, actually, yeah, 10 mm-hmm. feet. That's 10 feet. That it's 90% likely to be mistaken for a beholder. Um, I suppose that's probably some type of uh, evolutionary defense mechanism on the gas spores part. Possibly. Uh, it does look just like a beholder. So if you look mm-hmm. at the picture and you you kind of think, whoa, this, what's guy, this guy with the sword doing to this beholder? But it's not. It's gas spore. Yeah. Uh, so the gas spore itself isn't really too... Uh, dangerous of a creature if you just leave it alone. Uh, it's non-intelligent. It's, I mean, it seems like it's uh, uh, it's not an, an an animal at all. It's a fungus, actually. Uh, non-intelligent, and and the eyes that you do see on it are non-functional. They're just there for to trick you to thinking it is a beholder. But the thing about it is, because it's going to be trying to trick you into thinking it's beholder. Um, looking at it from an evolutionary standpoint again, its goal is 
to spread its spores and to reproduce that way. And the way it reproduces is it needs to be struck like a pinata hmm. so that all of its gas spores could be released. So when your intrepid fighter goes rushing towards the, the uh, what he thinks is a beholder to try to take it out or – Maybe he doesn't know what it is. As soon as it's struck for even one point of damage, it explodes with gaseous contents uh, reacting violently to the air. And I'm reading here, but it's it's worth pointing out. So uh, if every cre- every creature within a 20 foot radius takes six to 36 hit points of damage, wow. and even with a save, you're still taking some damage. And uh, if it actually manages to get make contact with your flesh, then the uh, spores get into your flesh and you have to get a cure disease within 24 hours or die and you will then sprout gas spores yourself. They, they made it so easy to hit this this creature that its armor class is 9. Yeah, I'm surprised it's even not. I guess it's just because it's not that big. No, and you still no. have to try it a little bit. No, they made it as easy as possible and one point of damage will just make it pop. I mean, this is the kind of creature that uh, you could almost think of it more as a trap than a monster, except for the fact that it's a monster because it does, uh, it is a creature. But it's the kind of thing that reminds you when you're playing the game that you're, that if you're going through with a hack and slash mentality, that the moment you see something, the first thing you do is attack, uh, even at a low level, you, or even at a high level, your survival is not guaranteed. No, so you fighters out there that like to go charge and attack, you know, be careful. That's pretty good, right? Yeah, it is. Re- it is really good. I like this creature a lot. Mm. Good, good, good find, Mike. Thank you very much. Yeah, and and the great thing about the gas spore is that at any at absolutely any level, it's it's a great thing to put in front of your players because the issue will not be how powerful is your paladin. The issue is going to be how good of a player are you. Yeah, lawful stupid, right? Lawful stupid. Welcome to Playing Tips. Okay, player tips this week. Developing your character's backstory. This should be fun. Yeah, this is a good one. I think this is a good one for... um, From what I know about the way that our campaigns run, our respective campaigns, yours and mine, Mm -hmm. uh, I think this sounds like the sort of thing that I would expect that your players probably have quite a bit of backstory in them. Uh, yeah, I actually uh, have required my players to give me at least something, uh, a couple paragraphs on their character history, because I don't want just Joe the Fighter running around, and we don't know anything about Joe the Fighter. <laughs> Fighting Man. My, his, my, my character's name is Fighting Man. <laughs> Fighting Man. Woo, original. <laughs> no, somebody had that in the forums, and I love that response. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good thing to talk about, so... With the backstory, I mean, I've seen games or campaigns where the DM has actually come in and said, here is your backstory, which some players, especially new players, it's a really good thing to do. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's a question. Sometimes it's because your DM's a control freak, uh, but Mm -hmm. sometimes it's because your players would like to have something given to them. Uh, In other cases, I've seen players come in, you know, completely set up with their backstory, and the DM kind of uh, has a world that is deliberately a bit loose so that those players can help shape the direction of where it goes. But in in my own campaigns, kind of the sweet spot that I've found is that people don't necessarily come in with their backstories that ready to go at first uh, at, the, at the beginning of the, at the beginning of first level, uh, because they really don't they don't know what type of a uh, campaign we're going to be going through, and we kind of uh, work it out a little bit together as we're getting ready to start a new campaign, talking a little bit about well, this is the uh, world we're going to be playing in, so are we playing in Blackmoor or Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk or a you know a campaign of of our own devising. And then once we've determined that and determined kind of where we are, then people can start thinking a little bit about, all right, well, what am I actually doing here? Well, how I, I did it was with my players. I said, this is where we're going to be playing, and I'm going to start with, for example, uh, James here. James, we'll start with your character. Now, the rest of you, I want you to sit there and start developing your character's backstory, get an idea of what you want to play, and write, write down two different types of characters, because you name, maybe you won't qualify for one of them. You don't know. And mm-hmm. uh, just write down something. And then when I moved on from James to say, Steve, 
James went and did his back background story. So everyone was pretty much ready to go after the last character was done. Well, that's another good point, is that um, if you're creating your characters, you uh, are going to be playing one of several different ways. You might be building your characters where you roll your attributes first and then determine what class that you qualify for, or you might be coming and saying, I want to be a ranger, and I'm going to move my scores around so that I'm appropriate for a ranger. Mm-hmm. That also kind of affects how much backstory you come prepared with in the first place. True. I've, I've known some DMs in first edition that don't let you just play whatever you want, and they say you have to qualify for it, just like the book says. Oh, yeah. I mean, I actually I was listening to, uh, I don't remember the name of the podcast now, but I found one that was recorded a couple of years ago. It was just a group of players going, going back and playing the first, uh, I think they were playing the Red Box, basic mm-hmm. D&D rules. And, you know, it's just them playing. It's just recordings of their gameplay, and, the, you know, the audio quality is not the best, but it was <laughs> worth, you know, trying to listen to. And as they're rolling up at the beginning, and they were rolling 3d6, you know, not, none of the uh, 4d6 and throw one away or 5 and assign wow. it where you want or anything like that, 3d6, and in order, and looking at this and saying, okay, what can I be? Uh, this is how I was brought into this world. What can I be? Hmm. Just play as you go. That's interesting. Yeah, and you know, in, in, a, in a sense, it kind of shamed me a little bit because here I've been saying, "Oh, look at all the stats inflation that has happened over the past few years," and blah blah blah. And then I went and listened to somebody playing the version of the game as it was even, you know, six, seven, or eight years before uh, I started playing Advanced, and going, "That's really different." Yeah, so. It was it was cool to listen to. I I, I, I think uh, of course part of the difference there too is that um, you know if it's a game where you're expecting to maybe play through about third, first to third level and not necessarily carry the campaign on for um, months or years, you wouldn't be quite as invested in a character that's going to survive. Um, and the same thing then with the backstory is if you are playing in a campaign where you're either uh, having a recurring character, so uh, you know some or, or or a lineage or anything like that, or you're playing with the same group and you've been doing this for years, you're going to be a lot more invested in your character, and I think that your backstory uh, is going to evolve over that time just naturally. You, yeah, I, I've seen that happen too. I just I like to have a little something written down by the par- I'm not asking for a lot, a couple paragraphs and then as we go along you can add to it, but I just want to have something that I can use so I know who the character is, like you said, just not a fighting man or whatever. The example. <laughs> well the other big advantage of the backstory from the player's pers- I mean from the DM's perspective if the players are writing it is the point of your campaign is, or at least it should be, for everybody to be having a really good time and playing the game that they want to play. So by having your players sit down and write out that backstory about who they are, you're not only getting them to be more invested in their characters, but you're also you're you're learning what kind of game they want to play. So if mm-hmm. my player says uh this is Red Sonia and she's an assassin and she was abandoned by uh some priests on a mountaintop and this that and the other kind of thing happens I kind of get a feeling for the expectations he has for the type of game campaign that we're going to have. Um, and so as you see people build those up, you get a feel for maybe where you want to take the campaign. Right. I, I just wanted it done because I really got sick of seeing my guy is six foot two. He has long dark hair and a ponytail with a beard. He is muscular and he carries a large axe, double ha- a double um, handed axe on his back, and he likes to kill everything he sees. And he speaks like this. <laughs> I was tired of that. Yeah, yeah. So, is it useful? Yes. Uh, I think it's useful for a simple reason. It gives your players a reason to think that, hey. Well, this DM's serious. Maybe this game will be around for a while, so we'll be playing it for quite a while. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, Jason, do you use backstory in your games at all? or? Well, you know, the game that we're in right now, we're kind of building the backstory, and that's my fault as the DM that people didn't come in with too much of a backstory this time, because the first question was, what is everybody doing in this town together? <laughs> and so uh, to avoid 
the you meet in a tavern and somebody sitting by the bar type of um, approach. I began by having a couple of the characters wake up in prison, wake up in a jail cell together. Oh, that's and so cool the qu- yeah. So the question had to be, okay, how did these guys get in the jail cell? What are they doing here? How are they going to get out? Yeah, in yeah. a world and where you're trapped in a jail cell. Yeah, well, it turned out they weren't really very trapped. They had simply been at the same tavern the night before and uh, had been thrown in for drunken disorderly conduct. But it gave an excuse for some of the other characters to come along in terms of uh, also gave them a quest, so to speak, to go on because if they're going to be let out of jail by the town council, they're going to have to do something in return. So, uh, But that kind of led to enough of a backstory that we built together. Um, and now that we're playing more through the uh, campaign and that uh, people are starting to get a little bit more into their characters and we're getting a little bit further along, I think the backstories are things that are going to evolve uh, a little bit. Just just for one example, mm-hmm. I had everybody roll up their secondary skills on the table rather than you know picking them necessarily. And so just using that secondary skill table from the Dungeon Master's Guide already gives you a great hook for your backstory. Hmm. If you rolled up uh, that you are a freshwater navigator, okay, <laughs> wow, why? Because the book says so. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 you, you look at that and you're like, I better come up with a good story to explain why it is that I'm here in uh, the desert and I'm a freshwater navigator. How did I get here? Okay, well... Some backstory is good. A lot of backstory is bad. Like ten pages worth of backstory. Really? You think it, why 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 would that be bad? Do you really want to read through ten pages of backstory? It depends. I mean, we've got a new player that's coming into our campaign who actually, in his case, I would love to read ten pages of backstory because he's an awesome writer. All right, maybe that's a good example. But I've seen ten pages of backstory of just dribble and drab, and it's just <laughs> no. Rip, yeah, I think if I out. got that, I'd probably just say, "Give me the cliff notes." Okay, well, uh, tell us your. If they say that is the cliff notes, then I'd say uh, uh, <laughs> the abridged version, five pages. All right. <laughs> uh, tell us your experiences, with backstories. Tell us what you do in your campaign. Tell us how you write your backstories. Artified staff at gmail dot com. As the party enters the last space inside the cave, a treasure can be seen. To stretch as far as the eye can see. Beware, as you have just entered the Dragon's Horde. This week in the Dragon's Horde, we go back to 1984, to Dragon Magazine number 86, and a necklace called the Necklace of Alteration. Hmm. So this was uh, created by Jerome Mayard and Bill Birdsall. Okay. And uh, I'll just give you a quick uh, rundown from this. This mystical item appears to be a cheap necklace, like any other sort of magical necklace, until it's put on. It then turns into a chain of silver with 12 small globes of unidentifiable material suspended from it. But if a globe is pulled free of the necklace, the globe turns into a particular type of material, and the wearer's body takes on the appearance and armor class of that substance. Hmm. So there's a tw- there's 12 different materials that could come up, and they are sandstone, mithral, gold, iron, platinum, granite, coal, salt, bronze, adamantite, lead, and wood. So you will actually, by wearing this necklace, you know, if you pull this free, you will be able to turn yourself to salt. So a pile of salt, or like a salt-like creature? No, no. You, you are uh, the material that you're made out of will appear to become salt. So you be a, so you'd be Mrs. Dash's cousin then. I think it's more like the Pillar of Salt. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, if you've been out in the Great Salt Lakes and you know seen that, it's a real mineral type of thing. Uh, so what will happen is this this effect lasts for two to eight turns. Okay. Uh, you And it would be a really surprising thing to have happen uh, to a player, to, you know, when they first put this on. Um, the only question is, how would you go about... 
I mean, let's say that you had the sort of player that wasn't necessarily likely once putting on a necklace to simply start pulling it apart. How would you go about prompting someone to do that? To get them to remove one of these on there? Um, I would probably do something along the lines with you're traveling and uh, say like something in the, the uh, atmosphere triggers it and you see it glowing. The only person's mm-hmm. reaction is going to be to like look at it, and I'll say, as you pull up that one orb, it seems to slightly give way and pull off for you, and then boom, that's when the effect happens. <laughs> sort of lead them yeah. into it, right? Yeah. So it, it's what I really like about this particular magic item is it doesn't fall easily into the uh, good or bad, bane or wheel type of... Uh, classification you know you could kind of look at this as a, almost a curse because you put this on and you pull off the salt uh, necklace bead you pull off the salt bead and suddenly your armor class is 10 <laughs> and you're made of salt and anybody can come up and you know whack you with a, a big club and you're going to fly to bits but on the other hand, you could pull the adamantite one and suddenly just completely from the nature of your, your uh, makeup now, you'll have an armor class of minus one. Um, it could scare you immensely having it happen. But on the other hand, if you actually knew what you had here, just the effect you could have um, on an enemy or somebody that you're that's not an enemy, you don't even have to be in a combat with them, just somebody who you are uh, trying to impress in one way or another, you reach up and you turn yourself to gold. Ooh. I, I can think of some amazingly uh, inventive things that a person could do with this. Yeah, I, I think you, uh, you scored big on this one because I could see some great possibilities of what we can do to uh, players with this. Good call. Yeah. And you know this. This actually, I, I I don't I don't mean to get too much into you know one one game versus another or anything like that. And I won't go into it here too much. But it does get me towards something that I've been thinking about a little bit lately. And that's I've been hearing a word from uh, other game systems from from listening to other podcasts and things that really upset me. And it was a word that was used. It was fluff. You know, I, I've been hearing people talk about things like, well, you know, if I'm going to create this monster, if I'm going to create this thing, and, you know, of course, the fluff part of it is, I guess you could explain this is why it's happening, but let's get down to the combat. And this is the kind of thing that I, you know, it's all fluff, I guess, if you want to call it that, but that's the whole point of this to me, is that they, this is the fun part of it. I mean, sure, there's some combat uh, issues that go around with something like this, but the very existence of a magic item like this in a game tells you a little bit of something about how that game is played. And if you're playing a game that's very, uh, you know, mechanical and it's back and forth, I hit you, you hit me, the only thing a necklace like this does, you might as well not even describe what it does. It's like, okay, your armor class is now six. But if you start looking at what just happened and you and you really describe this to your players and you explain that you were uh, for whatever reason you got a, you you got this necklace and you put it on and it changes appearance this cheap tacky necklace that you found in the merchant's stall and that they didn't know what it was worth and they gave it to you for a, for a silver piece or a copper piece and you put it on and suddenly it's this amazing silver chain with these different globes and then you take one off and here's the uh, amazing effect that happens and, and you really have to know how everybody reacts around you. To me, that's just such a rich game to be playing mm. and, and having things like this in here just kind of remind me of why it is that I play this game. Uh, yeah, I, I love playing first edition and I'm glad that I grew up during the time when these books were actually on the shelves and there was someone out there actually supporting it and you can write in Unlike now, these days you have to look on... For- Not that looking on the forums is a bad thing. I just... You don't understand what I'm saying, how it was that you yeah. had that official authority back then just to play. I don't know. That's how I feel. Yeah, so th- so that's my little bit of a soapbox. And while there's... <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not really trying to, to go on anybody here, but... Fluff? Really? Okay. <laughs> And that'll bring us to our library feature this week, and we have uh, Matthew Finch with us on the phone. Matthew, how are you today? 
Great, thanks. Good. Matthew uh, is was the initial developer of Osric, but he moved over and did uh, Sword and Wizardry. He was the designer of that product. Am I correct, Matthew? Okay, and today we invited you on our podcast because uh, we have a bunch of questions for you about uh, your designing the product and how you handle things. And uh, Jason, you had a couple questions to start things off, correct? Hey, Matthew. So um, a lot of what we talk about on the show, of course, is first edition AD&D, but of course we're all about just keeping old school gaming alive and vibrant. So we've been really interested in what's going on with everything that you've been doing and other people that are involved in retro clones. Now, my my own background is is a little bit, well, I haven't had a lot of this Mm -hmm. background with it yet. I've played a couple of Osric adventures at cons, but honestly, I didn't even know I was playing Osric adventures until afterwards, and the the DM said, oh, by the way, this was published by um, uh, Expeditious Retreat or somebody like that. Yeah, that that would be Expeditious Retreat. Yeah, which they make awesome stuff. Hmm. We played the uh, Shrine of Navakar or something like that. But uh, I wonder if you could give us a little of, bit of a clarity, first of all. When we're talking about swords and wizardry, Osric, Labyrinth Lord, etc., how would you characterize those as far as comparing them to the old uh, TSR first edition products? Um, well, the first thing you have to understand is that since they're created under the open gaming license, I'm not allowed to use anybody else's trademarks um, when I talk about the game. The real, the full extent of that legal uh, requirement isn't really clear. But um, in some ways, I'm actually the worst person to ask about which one maps up with the others. Uh, so, uh, and I realize that anybody who is getting into the the retro clone games faces a lot of confusion because there are a lot of them. Uh, so let me let me try and run through them being as clear as I can be. Going back to 1974, the beginning of role-playing games, uh, with the, the game you know that we all play, uh, originally written by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. 1974 version of that came out in three little books, and uh, those were in a white box, and the clone that matches up with that version is called Swords and Wizardry White Box. It is only uh, the material that was in those first three books that came out. After that box set came out, uh, TSR came out with a bunch of supplements to it, uh, and those included um, uh, several books, and uh, when you are looking at the original version of the game, including the supplements, then you're looking at Swords and Wizardry Core Rules instead of Swords Swords and Wizardry White Box. Okay. Then moving then moving forward in time, uh, we run into the first edition of the game, published uh, around 1977-1978. Mm-hmm. That's Osric, and that's the area that you guys are going to be the most interested in uh, for the purposes of, of, of what you play and what you cover with the podcast, is, is first edition, the advanced edition of the game, mm-hmm. uh, the one that most people have played. Um, and that's what you were playing at the at the convention, and the, the design principle of that is is designed to do exactly what it did to make it uh, to make itself invisible. When you're playing a game, you play an Osric module. You have no idea whether you're playing Osric or whether you're playing first edition. So, so how then does Labyrinth Lord come in? I, I'm actually about to get to that because that's the next. Oh, one sorry. <laughs> forward. That, no, no, that's fine. That's the next one forward in time along the timeline. Um, Labyrinth Lord, I had nothing to do with. That was uh, written by Dan Proctor. Um, it's a fantastic game. What it is, uh, what it clones, is the box set. Uh, the red box. Usually called, yeah, it's usually called the red box. It's the one with the Arrow Lotus cover. A huge number of people started playing with that, uh, and then a lot of them moved on to advanced D and D. But yeah, that red box version written by Tom Moldvay, that's what Dan Proctor's Labyrinth Lord game clones. Okay, wow. so it's, that's really interesting to me because I, like you said, like most people started out with that Moldave edition, but I was so young and I don't remember much of it. So I, as an advanced player, don't really know enough about the others, and I'm kind of learning a little bit by reading the stuff that you've been publishing. So to, to me, it's really that's pretty an interesting part of it because reading the PDF that that uh, is. That we used in our first in our first episode of the podcast about old school a primer on old school gaming. When I read that, and now that I've seen what you've done with uh, swords and wizardry, I've realized that maybe those 
white box and wood grain box additions were a little bit different. Uh, they weren't really meant to be basic, so to speak. No, they weren't at all meant to be basic. The, there are a lot of similarities with the basic rules because um, you know those the, the early version of the game, uh, you know, it was written as a very simple game, uh, something that people would apply a lot of imagination to building it out in whatever way they wanted to, or just in you know a sort of beer and pretzels game, keeping it exactly the, the way that it was, just with uh, uh, a lot of areas where the, the, the dungeon master is playing the game on the fly. And uh, you know what I said in the, in my inf- now infamous primer for old school gaming, uh, because a lot of people uh, you know got got very upset with me because there are a lot of opinions in it. But uh, <laughs> the, what I tried to get across was basically that there is an enormous difference between uh, the sort of freestyle gaming that was originally uh, intended for the game uh, versus um, a sort of gaming in which there are more rules for people to rely upon. Um, and the the game basically shows a spectrum. It, skipping the basic editions because those were also intended to be very simple uh, for play. But what you've seen um, from the very beginning is an increasing curve uh, toward providing the, the the players and the dungeon master uh, more rules to work from, and generally uh, a little bit more depth about the world. Um, one of the things about rules is they tend to imply the world uh, that you're playing in. Uh, and, and so that's the spectrum that we've seen. I haven't played fourth edition enough to know whether it really continues on that spectrum. A lot of people seem to be saying that it's backed off a little bit from the third edition in terms of, of more rules. But at least up to third edition, you're seeing that that spectrum develop. Vince, do you play fourth edition? Uh, actually, uh, I did actually play in a game the uh, following uh, a couple days ago, and they did back. I seem to think they did back off a lot of the rules, but then they added a lot of other stuff I didn't think was necessary. Well, they've yeah, just I've taken it in a different direction. Yeah, yeah. I've played a, a couple of sessions of fourth edition. It's just that I was a player, um, and we were playing uh, without anybody having read the rules except for the dungeon master. So it's, I have a picture of it, but it's just not uh, not anywhere near a clear enough picture to uh, uh, to talk fairly about what the game does. I didn't much like the way that combat worked. It seemed to have more rules involved. Yeah. But in the in in the areas where it was role playing. Uh, and just exploring and things like that, it did appear to have less rules, less stuff governing uh, how those parts of the game work. I agree with that, definitely. And Jason, you do play in a regular 4th edition game, correct? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I mean, the combat, what I would say is that it's not a question of whether it has more or less rules. It's more of a chess game now. You know, it's very much, you, you really kind of see people, players sitting there counting one, two, three, four, five squares and trying to place their fireball in an exact spot, and it's it's more of a video game. <laughs> well, so. I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with playing, uh, you know, a game in that way. And frankly, you know, a lot of the war gamers who started uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons way back in 1974, they were actually used to a, a game that was, you know, fairly specific in terms of rules. There's nothing wrong with it. I do think that some people prefer playing one way, and some people prefer playing the other. I don't think I have a preference. I mean, I play BattleTech, and that's you know the same kind of thing. But it's just not the same game. I just don't think that I'd compare them. Mm-mm. But I actually was thinking when you were saying earlier about uh, the progression of things into getting more rules based. As we've been doing this podcast, I've been going back and reading more uh, old interviews with Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson and and articles from around the time, and it looks to me like there was a progression as well, because if you read stuff that he said, that Gary Gygax said really early on, he seemed to be really against rules lawyers, and he'd get he'd make fun of people who mm-hmm. uh, would like write in to the publisher of a war game and wait for a ruling before they'd finish. <laughs> yeah. And then later on, you read these articles that he wrote in Dragon Magazine once uh, Advanced was out, and he starts getting very dogmatic and saying, you can do what you want, but you're not playing this game if you don't follow the rules this way or uh, if you don't do things a certain way. So it's like there was a progression there as well. Well, I'm no historian. I am I, not at all a historian of the game. Um, and there are many, many people who know much more about that than I do. Um, my sense of the way that uh, Gary's mentality worked 
his, I, I think he was always against rule lawyering. I think he was always in favor of having a very free form approach from the dungeon master. But I think what happened was that way back when they when they came out with advanced dungeons and dragons, uh, a lot of the concept was to have something that was standardized for tournaments, just to to open dialogues between people. Because when you're talking about original D and D, there are so many areas where the dungeon master has to fill things in that from one table to another, it was an entirely different game based on you know how it was or whether it was that they had filled in uh, areas of the rules with something specific or whether they kept it freestyle or you, there were so many different ways that I think that from a business perspective um, and also just from a, a creating a community perspective, uh, the idea at TSR was that they were going to get something more standardized. And that's why you see him saying you're not playing advanced D&D if you're doing it differently than this. What he was saying really was, you know, you're not, you're not playing the, uh, the official version of the game. For a long time, original D&D was still out there, still being marketed at the same time. And then I also, I read some stuff in one of the old Dragon magazines. I think it might have been issue number 43. It's got a picture of a witch on the cover uh, and, a, and a brown border around it. But in there, he begins talking about how there's going to be this new edition coming out. And that was one of the basic editions. I think it was the uh, the one that comes even later than anything that we've talked about. I think it was the Mensa. Expert. Uh, ex, yeah, the, 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 the basic and expert set. And the idea, and I really think their idea there was that if you were playing the basic versions, then you were playing in the style of the original Dungeons and Dragons. That was the version in which you could make things up, uh, work from a more freeform perspective, and that both games were out there uh, in parallel with each other. One of them being freestyle, and one of them being uh, advanced D&D, which was just sort of the you know the official you know one one way of interpreting it, but it was the official way of interpreting it. So I really don't think that his mentality about freestyle games changed. It, it did a little bit. When you look at his later games, there are more rules in them. Yeah. Uh, and he's covering different things than he did. I mean, clearly his thinking about uh, fantasy gaming changed. But uh, I, I think what you're also seeing there at the same time uh, is, you know, just an, an increasing corporate focus and, an, and also an increasing focus upon building a community uh, around the same game. Okay. Well, let's focus a little bit more on uh, the purpose of this. Let's talk a little bit more about you, Matthew, and uh, Mythmere and Knoxville Magazine. Can you tell us a little bit about both those? Uh, sure. Well, um, actually, Mythmere is just my internet name. <laughs> oh. uh, and so, uh, so Mythmere Games is, is really nothing more than um, a, a way of putting a name onto the, the project that I'm working on. So uh, there's not a lot to that. Oh. Knoxville, what Knoxville Magazine is, is it is uh, a magazine for people who play old school versions of the game, any of them, whether it's the uh, the original versions, whether it's the retro clones, it basically throws the whole thing into the pot. Um, most of it is uh, most of the discussion in there is phrased in terms of the retro clones, um, simply because you, um, once again, for legal reasons, you're a little bit restricted in terms of how you can mix and match discussion of those games. But really, anybody who listens to your podcast, Knoxville Magazine is going to have some stuff in there. Uh, for them, um, you, you do have to unwrap the code words a little bit. You're looking <laughs> at Osric, um, uh, you know, rather than you know looking for the for the trademarks. It's the same mm -hmm. thing in itself, so people should understand it pretty easily. And we'll put a link where they can grab your magazine, which is wonderful. We thank you for that. Sure. Now, what you and you guys can be perfectly clear about it. It's just that you know I'm the one person in the world <laughs> uh, who's entered into a who, who's entered into a contract not to say. Uh, you know that uh, you know that my game is compatible with this trademark name. You guys can do that. Yeah. I right. do okay. That. Well, we'll 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 try not to step in any weirdness while we're talking here. So, okay. so just so we don't confuse the conversation. Yes. And is what we can do is let's, we can we can do it this way. Um, your your audience on the podcast is playing first edition, and I can talk about first edition. <laughs> Exactly. Speaking of uh, our audience and players, what do you think the community is like around S and W and Osric and right now? Is it a large? Uh, in what, like, uh, what do you mean when you say what is the community like? like a large player base. Do you think it has a big following? Do you think it's uh, just catching on? What do you think its state is at right now? Swords and Wizardry. Um, Swords and Wizardry has got a player base that I'd estimate at maybe about four hundred, mm -hmm. um, four hundred to five hundred people, maybe. Um, just ex you know, it's hard, it's very hard to tell because the the game is available on a on a free PDF file. Right. Um, anybody can go and download that. Um, we've had you know thousands and thousands and thousands and 
thousands of downloads of that, but of course a lot of people are just taking a look at it. A lot of people will save a PDF file, put it somewhere on their disk and never take a look at it again. Uh, and some small percentage of those people are actually picking it up and playing it. Um, and then we're, uh, you know, we've, we've got several hundred sales of rule books as well. And so just, you know, sort of uh, doing a very unscientific throwing that all uh, together and, and making a, 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 an uneducated guess from it, uh, you know, I would say it's probably four or five hundred people. Has the is, uh, uh, go ahead? Sorry. Oh no! Has the hardback, uh, hardcover version of the book been made available? Yes. The uh, with, with Swords and Wizardry, we started out everything uh, through what's uh, Lulu dot com, which is a print on demand service where uh, we didn't have to print any uh, print runs of the books. That's just basically done when, by Lulu when somebody orders it. Uh, the, the hardback has been available through that for a while. Everything was available through that. At this point, just because of some uh, some difficulties with the way that Lulu was mailing things out and the way that their printers were interpreting some files, we started moving things over to Blackblade Publishing, uh, which is two guys, Alan Groey and John Hirschberger, uh, who are you know very much tapped into all of the communities there, and they've already done. Uh, one of the, uh, they did a conversion already of one of the Goodman Games uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics modules and converting that into first edition rules. And um, so they picked up Swords and Wizardry, and that has allowed us to go to doing actual print runs of the things and having a lot fewer problems with mailing things out. Oh, okay. That's what I didn't quite understand. That there, I thought that it was uh, still coming from Lulu on, you know, the, the print it when you buy it sort of things. Some things are. We're still in the, in the transition point between one and the other. Okay, so, but if somebody goes to Mythmere, uh to the website, they can get the one that's coming from Black, I'm sorry, Blackstone? Blackblade, uh-huh. Blackblade, sorry. Blackstone is our new reviewer that we're getting on the show next, next episode. I get go. confused. <laughs> there you go. Lots yes, of stuff with black and dragon in it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a lot of that out there. The uh, yeah, everything. We're, pretty much everything is going to be available through Black Blade, um, basically by January. Uh, I think that all of our uh, printed products that we had through Lulu will be available, uh, with the one exception right now of the hardback copy of the Swords and Wizardry Core Rules. Okay, so that's oh, I got it, got it. No, it's, I, incredi- what... it's incredibly expensive to print hardback books, and that's that's the thing holding that back is basically, uh, you know, all of the things that require a, a little bit less capital, those are going in first, just, you know, one by one, uh, you know, as we can get them to the printer and get them proofed and all of that good stuff. I'm really excited about all of these things ending up in uh, print runs, though, because I feel like once there's new uh, books that are showing up in the game stores around the country, it gives people permission to get out there and actually start playing those games. Whereas if I think if the only way they can play a system is to find an old copy on eBay, it kind of holds people back from wondering if there's a future in it. I think that's very true, and it is, that is most true uh, of the original 1974 version of the game because those, those box sets go for $200 at this point. Uh, and nobody, nobody new to a game is going to pick up a, a $200 copy of it to play with. At this point, they can download a free PDF, uh, or they can buy the the rule book. Uh, right now, it is going for twenty one dollars, which is dirt cheap in the in the uh, RPG rule book world. Um, so you know we've really lowered the barrier to entry. Now, uh, there you know most of the people out there never played that version of the game anyway. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people who are going back to that. I think part of the reason for that is the switch over uh, Wizards of the Coast from third edition to fourth edition. A lot of people got upset with that. They said, you know, hey, I'm going to stay with my other uh, edition that I was playing. And then all of a sudden, you know, the Thunderbolt hit, say, wait a second, you know, I'm completely free to pick whatever I want. Um, and a lot of those people are at the very least going and trying out the very original, uh, you know, the first edition ever of the game, which is the one that Swords and Wizardry covers. So we're getting a lot of people coming in and trying out Swords and Wizardry, I think, for that reason. Hmm. But if you're, if you're using the Swords and Wizardry core rule book, and then you go and pick up any of the other uh, books that came out from from TSR at that time. So if I go and I pick up a monster manual, but I am I'm DMing using the Swords and Wizardry core rulebook, I'm fine, right? Yeah, yeah. So so that's good for anybody that's listening. 
Yes, although remember that Swords and Wizardry is um, one edition before most of your listeners. It's not, it's not what's called first edition. Um, a lot of people call it zero edition. Right. Um, the, the first edition of the game is the one that most of your listeners cover, which is the one that came out in, like, 1978. Playing Swords and Wizardry with that, yes, it will still work. Um, but, you, but with Swords and Wizardry, you've got slightly less powerful characters. So if you're using a, a first edition module to play Swords and Wizardry, you're going to run into the same issue that you would have back in 1978, which is that the monsters are really, really tough. I know that's going to be really hard because a lot for my players, because the players in my game are all younger players who are coming from later editions, so they think that first edition, they're wondering why they can't be superheroes at first level. <laughs> Right, and it just you know th- that's one of the things is just to understand that the game um, doesn't really work that way, and that's fine. If you want to um, play a superheroes game, I think in a lot of ways you're better off with a set of rules that define um, you know the way in which your character becomes more powerful, and that's something that I think third edition did quite well. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of the advances that you make in third edition are in terms of some sort of personal skill or power that you have. And it's much more suited to uh, sort of that approach to fantasy. And then on the other hand, with with first edition and then you know zero edition, the seventy four edition, you've got a very different viewpoint of fantasy entirely, which is that everything is on the human scale. You know, you're just you know you are a human being. You don't get any stronger um, than just somebody who is a you know very powerful you know regular human. Um, and your objective is to is to work within that. That you know you, you you do get more powerful, but there is a point beyond which you know the human can't get any more powerful than that. And that is one of the places where the real game kicks in because you are uh, you know you're simply having to live by your wits. So so what is your background in terms of gaming? Because obviously something really drove you to this. Did you play um, a lot of other games in addition to first edition back at the back in the day? No. No, I'm one of the people who, who pretty much stuck uh, with playing Dungeons & Dragons. I started um, playing with... Uh, I'm, I'm in a, a, the generation before the people who started with the red box, and there were, there were quite a lot of us who started with uh, a blue basic box that came out, and I've forgotten when it came out. It was somewhere between 76 and 78, um, which is called the Holmes edition, um, but anyway, it was blue box. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a basic set. It covered from first level to third level, and um, we played that, and then the, there was an advanced D&D book out there. The Player's Handbook and the Monster Manual were both out. And so okay. people started playing advanced D&D, and then you realized that your advanced D&D set didn't contain uh, experience point. Uh, I'm sorry, it did contain experience points. It didn't contain to hit tables, because those were going to be in the Dungeon Master's Guide that hadn't been released yet. And so... <laughs> Everybody in that generation then had to go back to the if you if you wanted to know what your you know what your to hit roll was going to be when you were a fourth level fighter you had to go back and you had to look at the old books and so uh, people played a, a mishmash of all three of the versions of the game we played original D and D because that's where the hit to hit tables were we used uh, a lot of us used the initiative systems from from Holmes because that was what we'd learned on at the very beginning. Uh, because there weren't any advanced D&D uh, initiative rules. Again, that was in the, in the Dungeon Master's Guide. But we still had all the advanced D&D classes, and we used the advanced D&D experience point progressions, and so it really was a mix of everything um, that people were playing right at that point. I've always wondered what it was like just during that time, because when I started playing, the Dungeon Master's Guide was already out. I think I started playing in, like, 81 or something. And uh-huh. so... It's so strange when I go back and read the Dragon magazines that say, hey, we're going to come out with the Dungeon Master's Guide, and to think, well, then how would you play if all you had was, you know, if all you had was the Player's Handbook and the Monster Manual? <laughs> it's and a, and the, answer it's, was, the answer was that you had gone to a hobby store and gotten yourself a copy of the box set, usually, or else you had photocopies you know, of the parts that you needed, but... Uh, you know, and that, that in that generation, there's no way of really identifying what on earth anybody was playing, and w- which again, that's very similar to original D and D. You know, that that sort of you know, if you just are accumulating, you know, whatever you need for the game, that's very similar to the to the original D and D sort of version. So, well, that leads me to to another one of my questions then, because, uh, and it's about miniatures, since my impression of 
the very first editions of Dungeons and Dragons were that they were a uh, descendant of miniatures based gaming so there probably were more miniatures but by the time that I was getting into playing first edition in 81 82 we didn't use miniatures at all so how do you treat that like what's your opinions on it well once again I'm not a historian of the game um, and I well, what did you play with back then <laughs> We played with miniatures, but that was, uh, you know, and again, I, I started out as a war gamer when I was very young. Started out with Napoleonic war gaming, and at the store where we bought stuff, they had some Lord of the Rings war gaming figures, and so you know we got a copy of, uh, you know, a Gandalf or something like that, and we had some goblins, uh, and mostly we played with, you know, using coins to represent monsters, and then we used the same character figure for any magic user that was there. You know, that was our one Gandalf figure. And we used them mainly just to show uh, marching order. Um, you, you, we didn't really use the, the, the miniatures in the combat. Right, yeah, I, I, that makes sense, and it's kind of how I know that you know, we're playing in my uh, game right now, where we have miniatures just to say you're roughly here. But yeah. would you say that people who are playing Swords and Wizardry right now, is it fairly neutral as to whether miniatures you know, are part of the rule set or not? I, it's about half and half. I mean, I think even back in the old days, um, the, the although the game sprang from wargaming clubs, I get the sense that a lot of them did not really use the miniatures for for very much during uh, you know an original D and D game. I mean, my my sense of it is that you had the same split uh, that we do now between people who who simply like to be using miniatures to keep things a little bit more clarified and the people who think that. Uh, the miniatures get in the way um, of you know a fast-moving game that uh, that is fairly abstract in the combat. From what I understand, Dave Arneson's game used miniatures. Gary Gygax's game did not. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't really. That makes. I'm sorry, Jason. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say I didn't really ever use miniatures at all in first edition when I played back in the early '80s, and I didn't actually start using miniatures until I started playing third edition. A lot of us couldn't afford them. I mean, those lead yeah. miniatures. <laughs> yeah, they, they were. They weren't. They weren't cheap. No. It, yeah, and I think part of it was not being able to afford them or find them, and the other thing is that since I didn't start out playing with them, now I feel like it kind of takes me out of the game a little bit to have a miniature sitting there. Like I lose some of the um, imagination of it. I think that's true. Uh, I mean, I certainly, I am one of the people who likes having um, a cool painted miniature on the table. Um, and again, it's useful for showing where people are standing, um, and that can really be an issue when you're playing advanced D&D. Uh, and then when you get to, the, and then we, we don't touch them when we get to the combat, because the combat's so abstract that the relative position of the miniatures normally isn't all that terribly important. Um, yeah, I agree. You know, I like... It's it's fun to have the miniature, and I do actually have some nice miniatures now. But I agree, the same thing. It's just just to have it there, not to try to use it as a game piece. Yeah. It, it, so actually, you really stepped into a, a perfect spot for one more question that I had when it comes to specifics about swords and wizardry, because I've only uh, read through the core rule book uh, quickly. I haven't really perused it yet. So, in one of the things we're going to be talking about in a later episode is the whole idea of, uh, in Melee, if you read the first edition rules really closely, they t it says that you're not selecting who it is that you're attacking, that there's a chance, to, you know, it's, it's a rough Melee and everything's going on at once. Is Swords and Wizardry a similar uh, setup, or can you actually be a bit more specific about who you're attacking during a Melee? Depends on how you want to do it. Okay. I mean, that's that's something that would be completely up to the referee, uh, how exactly he wants to run combat. Um, you know, uh, again, you know, when, back when I started, uh, you know, my recollection uh, of the rules, of the, of the Holmes version rules, was that you could select who you were attacking or else it just didn't say anything about that. Um, you know, I, I do seem to recall that in the original D&D &D rules, um, just like in the advanced D&D &D rules, uh, if, you are, if you're shooting arrows into a melee... Uh, you've got a random chance to see who you're going to hit. Right. Okay. Well, I've got one final question for you. Let's talk about uh, artwork. Uh, okay. I, I noticed the artwork in, in, in S&W and Osric, both of them had that old-school feeling to it. 
Now, did you scour around looking for artists that had that feeling, or did you hire someone specifically for that, or just happen to stumble across a friend that was drawing like that, or how did that work? Um, well, we were definitely looking for that style. We didn't want to uh, have anything in there that was strikingly out of place with the other artwork. You have to sort of pick, uh, you know, one method of doing art in any publication that you do, pretty much. People don't, um, you know, you, you, your eye trips over it if you see something that's wildly different from the other art. Um, so we, we wanted to go with sort of that, that old style look. And um, uh, a lo- I did a lot of the artwork that's in Osric. Um, and I'm oh, not you a did. Tarot- uh, I did you a lot did, of you it. You did it. I- uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I'm not a particularly good artist. Um, the, the style that I use, the way that I learned to, to do the pen and ink work was by looking at, uh, you know, how it was done by Otis and Trampier, um, who were the, you know, the, the big first edition artists. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, and so I ran with that. And we basically just, uh, uh, kept it to the idea that we were going to do a, a, a minimal amount of grayscale uh, type of work, and that to the, to the extent possible, we were going to use pen and ink. Hmm. The cover of the white box for Swords and Wizardry, um, I haven't I haven't looked at that close up. I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but when I looked at it from a distance, it instantly made me think of Phil Foglio. That's interesting. Um, the uh, all of the cover artwork for Swords and Wizardry so far has done, been done by an artist called Pete Mullen. And uh, all the work that uh, he had originally been doing in color um, that I took a look at on his website was, um, I thought that it was most reminiscent of Errol Otis. Um, but, uh, you know, Phil Foglio was an artist with a wide range of, abil- of, of talent abilities. Still uh, is. Still is, yeah. I don't mean it. Yeah, he's doing it. He's doing great. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, he's doing amazing stuff right now. Definitely worth checking out. He's got some cool comic books going on. Yeah, he's a he's a great artist, and he was you know always did uh, uh, some really funny stuff in the old Dragon magazines. I mean, probably everybody <laughs> listening to the podcast already you know, has, has seen those, but. Oh yeah, Phil and Dixie. I mean, are as much a part of that era as anything that was done by the actual game designers, as far as you know, my memories. I agree. Okay, but you know, when I'm looking at the white box, I mean, maybe it was just the color scheme or something. Uh, it just took me back to his artwork right away when I saw that. So just yeah, just- it's, it, he's he's done some he's done some wonderful stuff. Um, uh, you know, I, I really, really like everything that he's done, and he's also broken out it since originally doing the work for Swords and Wizardry. He's gotten commissions um, both from Expeditious Retreat Press. He's got a couple, mm-hmm. um, and well, let me just say, yeah, I, I think there are others, but since I don't know for sure, I'll, I'll say. But definitely, he's he's branched out. He started getting hired by you know many other fantasy uh, fantasy game producers. Do you ever work with the uh, the fellows at Expeditious Retreat or any other? Uh, I don't know if I want to say companies because I'm not exactly sure how many are you know full fledged companies or not. Definitely worked with Expeditious Retreat Press. Um, you know, Joe Browning is a great guy. Um, the first of the modules uh, that they did for Osric, um, Pod Caverns of the Sinister Shroom, uh, that one I wrote uh, and illustrated, and then he went on and. Uh, from that point, um, he's had modules published by uh, James Carl Boney, who I think is a phenomenal uh, module writer, and uh, and several others. And I think he even wrote. I think Joe even wrote one uh, himself as well. Um, but yes, definitely worked with him. Um, pretty much hand in glove, right from the point that Osric was publicly announced. So we were working on that. Stuart Marshall and I were working on Osric for a couple of years before it actually came out. But really, the moment that it came out, uh, Joe and Expeditious Retreat were, were right on top of that as being a way to publish old school materials uh, through an avenue that they hadn't really had before. Um, and so, you know, he was a tr- Joe was a tremendous help as, as Osric began to develop. Okay, great. Uh, Matthew, I would like to thank you for coming on the podcast this week and uh, sharing your insight with us. 
My yeah, pleasure. I just want to say, Matthew, thanks for all of the amazing amount of work you've been putting in on this because uh, it's it's bringing a whole new world of gamers into this. So thanks for putting in a heck of a lot of work. No, uh, just, well, again, it's it's that's my pleasure. That's what I'm, what I'm hoping to do and hoping to achieve. Excellent. If anyone needs to contact you, Matthew, how can they contact you? Well, probably the best way to uh, to find everything that we've got is just to come to www.swordsandwizardry.com uh, and then hit the forums from there. Okay, and do you have an email address that you like to give out to people, or are you rather not right now? Uh, the, the, the email address that I use is mythmere, M-Y-T-H-M-E-R-E, at yahoo.com. Oh, great. Great, folks. Uh, if you want to give him a shout-out, give him a shout-out. He'd, he'd be glad to answer your questions, and we appreciate you joining us this week. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Stickler's Spotlight. Okay, and that'll bring us to uh, one of our final segments this week, folks. The uh, the Stickler's Spotlight. And we have a great one here this week, uh, Jason. It's called Grading Your Players, DM. Yeah, you got me with this one because um, I've, in reading some of the feedback that people have had about our podcast so far, I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, a lot of people have pointed out that it sounds like we've got two different DMs here, one who's a bit more of the free, artsy approach, and one who's the, you know, I'm looking at the charts, I got the rules, I'm ready to go, and I'm pretty sure I'm that second one. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> no. but, you know, so here's one that when you brought it up, I was like, what? You, what? I don't know that rule. Yeah. So I had to go back and look. And you're right, I do know that rule now that you say it. Now that I, I, I've, I've seen this before, but I've never, ever used it. So, Not at least in this yeah. point. So quickly, uh, everyone, because we've all read the book, and more if you're new listening, you will read the book now. Going up in levels in first edition is not automatic. It's not just assumed that you go up in a level, unlike the later editions when you just, boom, you're the next level. You get all the little wonderful things that go with it. Right, and I want to be clear, I don't... I don't give people automatic level advancements. No, 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 no. You just weren't you weren't using this particular method at the time. Uh, basically what it tells you is that every uh, player is... A DM is supposed to grade every player based on the sessions at a 1 to 4 level or an E, S, F, and a P for excellent, superior, poor, and fair. E, yeah, I know. I like the fact that he actually came up with the, with the letters. You know, uh, I'll give you an S. <laughs> so yeah. Excellent, uh, superior, fair, right. or poor. Um, okay, so so there's specific, really uh, detailed kind of things in here, um, but I think it's you know again this is a guideline here. The, the important thing is that when you're looking back at how somebody has played their character throughout that uh, period that it took for them to acquire enough experience points to be eligible to the, for the next level, uh, the way how well they played should figure in to how difficult it is for them to actually advance to the next level. Definitely. And this, uh, my, I actually just started using this uh, maybe a couple weeks ago in my game uh, because my players, uh, are. I want them to level a little slower. So I started adding yeah. in, it's a, it's a great feature actually. Uh, I, I like it because I every after every session I jot down how I think a player played because sometimes... It, you know, some players will just be out there to uh, crap on your game, and they'll just annoy the crap out of you that game. <laughs> hey, you know what? You go. You spend a lot of time prepping for your game and trying to get a nice, decent game going. You got one player that's in a crappy mood. He comes into your game and just tries to, you know, stick it to you and go this way. The uh, you know, perp you know those people that purposely do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess. I wouldn't even necessarily say it has to go to that that point because if you have a player that's getting that bad, I mean maybe they're really just not having fun and they don't want to be in the game anymore. And maybe you shouldn't have them in your in your in your group. Mm -hmm. uh, but but for somebody who's, um, I don't know, what, whatever the, the things are that you think are um, driving the game off track. So the 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 point of this seems to be that if somebody has been the, well, the way he spelled it out, let's just read the specific classifications. It says to mentally classify the overall performance as either excellent, few de deviations from norm, superior, deviations minimal but noted, fair, more norm than deviations, and poor, 
show, poor showing with aberrant behavior. So it's really talking about the how well did they uh, perform in the character of his or her class. So was, if it's a cleric, is he acting like a cleric or is he actually running around acting more like a fighter? Is the magic user spending more time being worried about treasure than about knowledge? Is the assassin... Uh, well, I don't mean I actually haven't played assassins in my campaigns, but you know, is the assassin um, acting people? more like a thief than an assassin? Yeah. So, and what it really ends up boiling down to here, and this is why there is a one, two, three, four, because it has to do with how many weeks of study or training are going to be necessary to advance to the next level. Right. So if you can you can advance really quickly, and it only take you one week, or uh, the average is out to be four weeks for one level. It's just that's gonna how it's going to affect everything. Yeah, so the idea here is that if you have somebody who's been playing very poorly, uh, then they're going to get a four, and that will actually take them four weeks. And, of course, there's the cost. So even, I mean, even if your game doesn't have a lot to do with time, that would they'd say, okay, fine, it took me four weeks. Well, it's going to cost them more mm-hmm. um, than that. So just normally... You're going to be taking the level of the trainee character times 1,500 gold pieces, and uh, that's your weekly cost. So if it's somebody who's at third level, and it's taking, and they've gotten a four, you know, so at third level you're talking 4,500 gold pieces a week, and then you're talking about uh, if it was just one week, great, that's 4,500 gold pieces. But if you're talking about four weeks, then you're talking about what, um, 18,000 gold pieces, and that's a big difference. A big difference. And I don't know a lot of DMs that actually use this method, so I decided to uh, implement it just to see how it worked out. That's kind of okay. like, like a test. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll give you an update a couple episodes later, uh, issues I should say, later uh-huh. uh, of how it's going. And uh, tell us how it's going with you. Maybe Jason might want to try it out once or twice. I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm going to try this out actually. Because, well, the other thing about it is that it leads into the whole issue of leveling up. Mm-hmm. Because right now, um, well, I said that my players don't level up automatically, but at the moment they're running through the U-series, and so, I mean, even in the modules, the authors say, listen, you probably should just go ahead and level up at this point, because you're going to really disrupt the gameplay. So, we're just, I'm just giving them their levels at this point, when they earn the experience points to do it, but once they get past this, we're going to go through actually what it means to level up. So, uh, the magic users are going to have to seek out some uh, elder mage that can provide them with uh, training and spells. The fighters are going to have to be able to train a- as a fighter for a bit. I guess the whole idea is that as a character, um, some things just happen naturally. And I think it's pretty fair to say that a ranger's tracking skills can just inc- increase naturally. Cool. A thief's lock-picking skills may improve to a certain point. But there's also the time that you need to have uh, to go back and reflect and study and train if you're going to get better at anything. Right. Uh, you know, whether it's getting better at sword play or getting better at uh, learning some more... I think clerics are actually probably the best example because they have new prayers to learn, new rites to study. So um, there's a very natural kind of thing there. So then the question is, in the game, uh, if you're keeping track of time, there ought to be some way to actually make a difference if something takes three weeks to do versus one week to do. Um, So I guess the next thing for me to do in the game is to figure out, could there be something that the players are eager to get to, You know, that maybe the value of it goes down as time goes on, or the really exciting thing that that maybe there's a couple of different things that they could be going on to do. One of them, they're going to have to leave really quickly. The other one can wait. And so they're hoping that they can get through their training quickly enough to make it to the one that they really wanted. And if somebody turns out, you know, my training took three weeks because I wasn't a good thief, then that would be a good punishment. Or not punishment, but disincentive. Mm, I see what you're saying. Uh, and this is probably going against the norm because I'm not really, as you pointed out earlier, someone said there's two different types of DMs here, and I was more of the free spirit and go on the fly, and you were more of the stickler DM. So we're kind of reversing roles in the situation right here, right now. So, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, like I said, you're the DM, you do what you you want to do. So, tell us what you do, RFI staff at gmail.com. 
Well, Jason, I think that's going to wrap up the issue this week. Yep, that's going to be it for this week. And uh, let's see. We've got is is next week the the New Year's show. Uh, I believe uh, next week's going to roll us into the New Year's Eve show or uh, the new new depending on when it's released the new year show. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, we, I think it's okay to tell everybody we record our shows a, a little bit ahead of time so that we can catch up, and I'm trying to remember exactly when this one's going to release. But I think it's okay for me to say that we'll see everybody next year, and we hope that they've been enjoying the show so far. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this should, we're, we're a week ahead a little bit right now because we like to keep it that way, but we do edit in segments as we need just to keep yeah. it fresh and original. <laughs> I think by the time that, that that you hear this, listeners, I think I'll be in Tokyo at at this point. So, um, oh, wow. say hi to me on the other side of the world if you're over there. We'll, we'll give you a big konnichiwa, and uh, we hope you have a great time. So, folks, we'll be signing off for this week. This is DM Vincent saying, keep it original, keep it old school, and and this is DM Jason saying, bye for now. Roll for initiative.